loud. We're here at Sebring. I'm Dan Johnson. I'm talking with Darren Hart, and he's the guy behind this handsome airplane behind us, but that's not what we're going to look at. Handsome, huh? <laughs> The airplane. No, the, the airplane. airplane. Oh, okay. Well, that's about a big head now. Okay, so you got a new float system for your airplane. Now, you've had floats in the past that you got from some old neighbors of mine in Minnesota, and then they decided to leave the business. So, what? You're stuck? You got to make your own floats? Well, to be honest with you, we didn't want to be in a float business, and uh, now we are. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the old float design from Bauman, they went out of business about five years ago, and kind of left us hanging. Yeah, uh, yeah, you did a lot of work to develop with them, I know. Yeah, we had four year, uh, four floats, uh, sets of floats on order from them, and they go out of business, so we have, you know, customers want the floats, and then we're hoping that other manufacturers will step up the plate and do floats, and, uh, and things didn't pan out. You just didn't find what you wanted to, yeah, and so, did your own thing. So we decided to do our own thing. Okay. So, okay, so tell me a little bit about it. Well, what these are, these are a, a carbon fiber, a composite float. They're carbon fiber and Kevlar uh, construction, and we use honeycomb. And the reason we do the hybrid fabric call it is because of the impact resistance of using carbon and Kevlar together. If you uh, hit a stump or a rock, you don't want things to shatter. You want things to be... Uh, that's where the Kevlar comes Yeah, Kevlar. You know, Kevlar they use in bulletproof vests sure. and stuff like that. So People can imagine how that works because if it takes a bullet, it can probably take a rock too. Yeah, it'll take a rock. So, okay. you know, the, so we built the floats on that. But our number one goal was, was keeping the weight down on the floats. And how, how well did you do it then, John? We met our target. We came in right at under two, uh, 230 pounds on the total install of the 230 float. pounds. Now, you're not talking just the float itself here. You're talking the mechanism for the uh, attachment to the floats. And, well, what else? Well, basically from this point on down. For, you know, landing gear attachment point down. Yeah. Right. Okay. From landing gear. Now, you don't forget, you get 75 pounds credit for your landing gear, your okay. wheels and brakes, your tail wheel and leaf spring. So that works out to 155 pounds. So you can take that 230, extract 75. Okay. That equals my math. I think 155 pounds. Okay. So and then under light sport rules, they got to go up to 1430. Right. Okay. So now we end up being a 45 pound penalty on our weight compared to a land airplane. Oh. Okay. So the net result then, let me just summarize: from a land airplane, at which you're allowed no more than 1320 to an LSAC plane where you've got 1430, you all really only added 45 pounds. Yeah, we're gonna educate over, over what it was. Right. Yeah. It's an, so we're gonna educate an amphib C plane. An amphib. Amphib C plane, yeah. yes, that's a good clarification. So, let's keep on talking about that. Now, Light Sport, under the ASTM certification, allows you to go to 1430 gross weight, right? right. Uh -huh. Well, underneath the rules of a two-place SLSA aircraft, you know, we have rules that we have to meet a minimum empty weight of the aircraft. Right. So the formula on that is that 290 pound people plus one hour of fuel at cruise power. Really? Six gallons an hour, 36 pounds, so you do the math on that, right? So the formula works out that we have to meet 1,014 pounds or less on the air. Yeah, you cannot be above that. No. It's not actually a specification, but it's a calculation, calculation. that arrives at that. Right. You cannot weigh more than that empty. Right. And right. we want to call this a, a true uh, SLSA two-place aircraft. So we met our goal. We have to be very careful on the configuration of the aircraft. We can't have a lot of the bells and whistles that you normally put on. You'll notice this has a real basic uh, instrument panel on it. Uh, we have a, a lightweight paint package that we have to put on the airplane sometimes. Right? Even yeah. the paint. I mean, I know paint can add up, but yeah. even that you got to so trim that down. Trim as much that as you down. Can. So where else do you save in weight here? Well, on the airplane, you have to look at everywhere you can possibly save weight. And we do a lot of lighting poles and, 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 and the secondary structures and, and uh, in the aircraft just to save weight. Like this step here is a carbon fiber step. I see. Like okay. That. Okay. So, and the biggest I thing. Mean, even that's getting down to a fairly small detail, a piece of small aluminum there. Wouldn't weigh a lot, but you went a little bit further and got it down some more. Right. And then you have to look at the. Uh, the washers, you look at the handful of washers you get in your hand. You need five pounds of washers in there. Is that right? Now, guess what it goes to when you go to aluminum washers? What does it go to? A third. Is that right? Wow. So you end up getting about wow. half a half. So little things and little details. That's a lot of little bits and pieces, yeah. though, to trim weight down to what you need to get to. But uh, that's what makes the makes things work and under the lights for holes and stuff. Okay, so the so the entire fuse, uh, the entire not fuselage, the entire uh, float body that I'm seeing is composite, right? Nose to tail, a combination of the two materials, right? And you're using carbon fiber, I assume, where you got stress points and things like that. Mm -hmm. 
and otherwise it's all Kevlar? It's mostly Kevlar? No, if you look inside the float, which uh, yeah, we'll open up, maybe shine the camera on it earlier, you'll see the, the carbon fiber and the hybrid. It's a hybrid fabric, which is basically the, the weaving of the fabric. You know, we have the Kevlar with and both? the carbon. Yeah, oh, okay, with both okay, okay. mirrored or weaved together, and that's okay. how they create it and stuff. And it's a uh, it's a manual system, system gear. It's uh, basically a Johnson bar. But uh, yeah, when the gear handles down, the gear's down. When it's how much force are we talking then? If it went all mechanical, it's about twelve to fifteen pounds. Oh well, that's not it's bad. Not bad. It's a real simple. It's uh, basically the same thing that was used in the old Bauman design. We redesigned a little bit and improved it. And what do you have to do to tell ASTM it meets it? Well, you have the ASTM you know guidelines where you have to follow and stuff. And basically, what we did is that we tested the airframe and the floats together. Okay. So. On one of the tests, particularly the, the step test, now there's there's all kinds of tests you do on there. We end up probably doing about 70 tests on this. Area. 70 tests? Yeah, all together. Just to do floats? Just to do floats. Okay. You gotta do pressure tests, you gotta do, you gotta substantiate your strut design, you gotta, if you land, bow first, you're yeah, bringing okay. all that pressure up on that a whole bow. different set of uh, forces. It's kind of like trying to break the bow off the float. Okay. So when you're doing that, you have to load up a whole fuselage, and, uh, and stuff, but on the step test and stuff like that, we put 9,000 pounds inside this airplane. <laughs> because you got to think, we, on ultimate loads, you have to go to six Gs. Wow. So you can imagine, you know, you're that's a feet. lot of sandbags or something. That, that, that fuse lodge to get to 9,000 pounds. It's completely full of sandbags, plus we have pull down points on the fuse lodge, yanking it down. You couldn't even put enough stuff inside. We lift the forklift off the floor. Wow. We did the test. Wow. Yeah, okay. it's a, uh, and then are you dropping it? You're, you're dropping You're right? testing that condition. You're testing for in a water load condition. Yeah, you're so testing. you're actually going to strike the ground? Or strike something? the ground with water. You're trying to break the valve. You got the stern load to the back. Try to land with the stern. Okay, as if somebody came in way, uh, way flared. Dropped it. Uh, okay. And then you have your ground loads where you actually pick the aircraft up at gross weight, and then you put safety margin on top of that, and you pick it up. And to then you just drop almost 19 inches, and quick release, bam, down down to the ground, and there it goes. And stuff. Wow. And it all has to stay together and. Nothing breaks. Yeah, you get a like certain that. amount of deformation allowed or any deformation. Well, on the limit loads, you can't have any deformation. Okay, just on a limit. Ultima loads, you have, you're allowed to have deformation, you just can't have a catastrophic failure. Yeah. The way here, put some time on the airplane. Yeah. How does it fly with the floats? Tell what? me some differences. The, uh, on all we're testing, we're, when the airplane's light loaded with just one person, and we're seeing an average takeoff between six and seven seconds, which is pretty Is that right? Yeah, that's a good number, six and seven. So, and you're using uh, Continental O200? No, this one has the light combing. This has the light combing, the O233 O233. Okay, so you get a little more juice out of this one than you did out of the Continental. It's 115 horsepower. 115, is that what it puts so, out? Okay. Uh, so we're seeing an average of six to seven uh, seconds, and then when you get fully at gross, you know, you'll see about a 10 or 11 second takeoff. Okay, well that's still a pretty, yeah, that's, that's a pretty, pretty darn good. And I, all right, so how does the airplane actually fly? You flown the land, your land planes a lot, I know, so what do you see in the differences with floats? Well, I tell everybody a float plane is the easiest airplane you ever land. And why is that? Well, the reason why is you have this big, very wide stance of all landing gear. You're not a tail wheel configuration, you're a nose wheel configuration. But the landing gear is very wide stance, it's like landing a shopping cart. And I can tell everybody it's like landing, landing with Velcro on the aircraft because once you're down and the... You're staying down. You stay down, the, the angle attack on the wing goes flat. On a tail dragger you have a high angle attack. Ah, sure, sure. So, uh, and there's really not much of a cross wing component in an aircraft. You can be in a, I've been as high as 18, 20 knots, and in an airplane you just put the one wheel down and the other wheel comes down and it just stays on the ground. So it's a very easy airplane to land on land. Of course, water is the same for every float plane. You just, well, you're always into the wind. Always at into least the wind. if you're behaving properly. Right, so. And you got the right lake in at least, or river or whatever, you land into the wind. Yeah, pretty much right. into the wind. Correct. So it's just a, you know. How about uh, performance? When you add the floats to it, the logic tells you, well, it's got it's to add some drag. It's got to take some speed away, does it? Absolutely not. It does not? It does not reduce the speed. Uh, we can't tell either two or three miles per hour. Is that right? That's, yeah. I have to say, that's almost a little hard to believe, although you haven't got a cup. It was never the fastest thing in the sky to begin with. So you're saying this doesn't detract from that at all? No, we were cruising up. We had two Super Legends coming up from Texas, uh, Sebring. And uh, we were going. Same engine? Same engine. Okay, so you've got light combings all around. Light combing. No after, difference there. The only difference is the amphibs versus the, uh, the tires. And we're burning exactly the same fuel and exactly the same speed.
We're in production right now. Of course, we have about four month backlog on the aircraft. Of course, the floats for all that. So we have uh, seven sets already sold before we even you know, came out in the market. That's good. That's good. Uh, mainly for cover a little bit of that investment. Well, it's existing customers like we were first talking you know, early on. Ah, yeah. These customers are waiting for this pamphlet close for a long, long time. So, uh, so they're going to be the first ones to get the, uh, get the sure, sure, good. Well, they'll be satisfied. So, about four months to get it. Four months to get an airplane. Yep. What? Now we don't do price too much on these videos, so folks check with Darren later. We'll give you the address later. How you find them? It might be a different price set, but get me get me in the ballpark anyway. What this adds to the basic area. Okay. Well, the floats, the amphibs themselves, we charge thirty-seven thousand five hundred dollars. Okay. And the base price on the airplane is one fifty-four. Okay. That's without the avionics package and stuff like that. So you have to add the float cost plus the airplane, then the avionics and lights. So you can get up in the neighborhood of about two hundred thousand dollars. Okay. A lot of great information, Darren. Thanks a lot. Uh, where do we find you on the web? We'll put it up on the screen for folks. So where do we find you? Well, we're in uh, Sulphur Springs, Texas, and we're on the web. Of course, it's uh, www.legend.arrow. Legend.arrow. Legend.arrow is all you got to put in there. Okay, sounds good. You can find lots more on affordable aviation on bydanjohnson.com. Thanks for joining Darren Hart and myself here at Seabrook.